Hello, St. Peter's. We are so glad you are here with us today for worship. We hope you are staying safe and healthy. And now, here are a few announcements. We are having two session-hosted congregational Zoom Q&As. The first one is today, August 30th, at 1045. Or you may choose to attend the second one, which is next Sunday, September 6th at 1045 a.m. also. Interested members and friends are invited to gather for these session-hosted meetings. At our most recent congregational meeting, the session committed to discuss and answer important questions that arose that were not specifically related to the motions on that meeting agenda. Please send RSVPs and any additional questions to me, Valerie Ryan, clerk of session at clerk at spbts.org. Your spot will be confirmed via email with a Zoom link that will include a meeting ID and password. Session members will also soon be calling members and friends to reach out and have discussion. If a phone conversation is a more accessible format for you, please connect with the elder when they reach out to you. The session looks forward to further conversations with our St. Peter's family. This year, our fall sermon series theme is Love One Another, inspired by Jesus' words from John 13, verses 34 and 35, which read, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Close quote. When we love one another, we make God's love visible. Keep watch for our fall sermon series and our fall kickoff events planned for Sunday, September 13th. And great news, we will be going back to stage two of our campus reopening plan beginning this Tuesday, September 1st. Our updated church campus reopening guidelines can be found on our website, stpetersprez.org. Please get yourselves acquainted with this new phase, which begins this Tuesday, September 1st. Reservation requests for approved outdoor campus spaces must be made ahead of time and approved before confirming your ministry area events or gatherings. Persons or groups should contact Laura Blakeman at uh, email address laura at spbts.org to submit a reservation request. Laura will provide group leaders with a checkbox commitment list to which they must agree to adhere to. And now, from wherever you are, let's come together and worship with one another.
Good morning and welcome to St. Peter's online worship. It is good to gather in this space. You know, I don't know about you, but uh, life continues um, to sort of feel like this uh, daily exercise of being pulled and stretched in many directions. Some of it um, really life-giving, some of it um, really wonderful, and much of it um, draining, uh, much of it uh, really consuming. However you find yourselves um, arriving uh, to this space this morning, uh, we want to say welcome. We want to say come as you are. This morning, um, our preacher is um, Anna Suddeth, who is our director of ministries to children and their families. And Anna is going to be preaching from the book of Romans, the 12th chapter. And that uh, chapter begins um, with the Apostle Paul saying uh, these words, I appeal to you, um, brothers and sisters, therefore, to present your bodies, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice. I'm holy and acceptable to God. And this is your spiritual worship. You know, I'm excited to see what M. Anna does with that text this morning. Um, but the way I hear it as we gather in this space is um, to bring yourselves, um, to bring ourselves individually and together, and to um, trust that the Spirit of our living God will meet us in this place. Um, welcome. Let us worship God together. Good morning, St. Peter's family. This morning we come together, we sing a song to our God. We sing a song of hope. Let's sing that song of hope that God gives us as children. Come on, let's sing it loud. we thank you for that hope. We thank you for that hope you give us as your children. 
God, we come together as your children today in different spaces, different places. God, we say we want to give you our hearts. We want to give you our all. This morning we sing of your good grace, God. faith, we make our confession to God at the beginning of our worship, 
so that we can be present to God's presence in this space. Please join me in this morning's responsive prayer of confession. Words are printed in the worship bulletins and on your screen. Let us pray. O oh God, we come humbly to you. We want to love you and our neighbors well, but we struggle at it daily. Confident of the grace you offer, we ask that you forgive us when we choose selfishness over sacrifice. Lord, please forgive us. Forgive us when we make things all about ourselves instead of about others as well. Lord, please forgive us. Forgive us when we are motivated by approval and praise instead of being motivated by your call. Lord, please forgive us. Forgive us when we choose hard-heartedness over hearts vulnerable enough to be changed. Lord, please forgive us. God, we turn to you now and offer our personal prayers of confession. God, draw us close and make us new. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. The new life has begun. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hello, St. Peter's. It's great to be worshiping together today. My name is David Yap. I'm your new finance elder. My wife and I have been members here for three years. One of the first things that attracted me to St. Peter's was the friendliness of the congregation on the patio. It's a real gift when you join a new community and you're accepted so quickly. When I think of faith giving, I think of giving to things that give me hope. The word of Jesus Christ and the strong foundation of believers in this church gives me hope. Please join me in giving to the church through the online giving option on the church website, or feel free to mail in your check to the church office. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King Take my lips and let them be Filled with messages from Thee Take my silver and my gold Not a mite would I
Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord. This morning we continue with our Rooted Sermon Series, exploring scriptures that root us when we feel uprooted. Our scripture reading this morning is from Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Rome, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 18. Speak to us, O Lord, for we are listening. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry and ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. 
Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, we ask that you open our hearts and minds today to be receptive to your word as Anna shares with us. Let the truth of your word be present and perceptible as she speaks to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It is so nice to be here with you this morning um, and to be here to offer um, our message um, for our worship service this morning. So working with kids and being a parent gives me a lot of rich opportunities to deepen my faith. Um, not because I get to marvel in the wonder of childhood um, or because I spend a lot of my time carefully planning lessons, even though both of those things are true. Um, I have mostly I have opportunities to deepen my faith because um, the youngest members of our church family um, say and ask the most confounding things <laughs> when it comes to faith. Um, all people who claim to be theologians, I think, should spend some time in a church school classroom and try and give some answers to the questions they receive. Um, some questions as simple as, who made God? And how is Jesus God and God's son? Um, once I was reading to uh, our preschool classes here at the church, um, I was telling them the Easter story, and I got to the big line about Jesus' resurrection. And I said, Jesus is no longer dead. Jesus is alive. And without missing a beat, one of the four-year-olds said, like a zombie? So in my experience, um, most of us as adults um, don't wrestle with our faith in that same way. We don't have um, these kind of big open-ended questions. Um, we like having answers more than we like having questions. Um, those open-ended questions seem a little more intimidating to us. We prefer clear-cut answers. Children are much more comfortable pursuing things that are unanswerable. Um, and they're not quick to settle on an answer um, just to have an answer. Hence the series of why, why, why. Uh, our scripture today deals for me with one of those faith questions that we really have to wrestle with. Paul's letter to the Romans um, addresses several matters of faith, especially what it looks like to believers um, to be righteous, to have righteousness, to have a right being with God. Um, the Apostle Paul reminds us um, that we're not righteous on our own. We receive our righteousness through Christ. And we are, when we arrive at chapter 12 at our scripture for today, we move into what righteousness looks like in practice. What does it look like in our lives to live that way? Um, so here we have the Apostle Paul's answer to what does faith look like. So like I mentioned, our brains like clear-cut answers. We prefer a closed loop instead of an open-ended uh, half circle. It's kind of the way our brains are wired. Um, they're wired to make sense of things and to close off those loops. Um, you know, if we're hearing a song, if someone sings a tune and then all of a sudden they stop, our brains have to finish it. Or if someone um, starts a familiar saying but doesn't finish it, our brains want to um, complete it. Um, or if you've ever kind of heard a scale and then not that last note hit, sometimes it's like just really unsettling. And there's a reason for that. It's because our bodies really want to have things closed and sealed off, even if it's not right or correct. That happens in our relationships. Um, maybe our partner or a good friend says something kind of offhanded and, um, and then leaves the room or is going to, you know, goes on to the next thing. But we're left trying to create a story about what did that mean and why they said that and why they were thinking that and what does it have to do with me? 
because our brain wants to create a story around that and have a clear-cut answer, even when it's not the right one. Um, but I think we have those same tendencies in our faith lives. We want to say, well, the Bible says, and leave it at that. We want to believe that we have an instruction manual in front of us, and that if we follow things step by step, then we will be the perfect Christians and our faith life will be exactly what it is supposed to be. Um, we see here in our scripture in Romans 12 that real faith lived out does not look the same for everybody. It's not a step-by-step -step manual. Real faith and righteousness is played out in our everyday lives, in everyday ways that are specific to each of us and to our situations, to our gifts, in our circumstances. A faithful life does not look like a very specific act of behaviors. Rather, it's a very specific posture of the heart that results in behaviors with certain characteristics. So here in chapter 12, verse one, that heart posture that I was talking about is called being a living sacrifice. Now, what does that mean? You know, for me, the, the idea of sacrifices conjure up images of death sometimes, of sacrificial offerings on an altar, of martyrs, maybe of people dying in battle. But this picture of sacrifice we hear, see here in Romans is turned on its head. The Christian life is one of sacrifice that is not dead. It's a sacrifice that is alive and living. It is not a one and done action. It's a lifelong journey that is paradoxical in the way that Jesus always seems to be. When our hearts are turned towards God and we humbly sacrifice our lives as we would have them in, fa as we would have them in favor of how God would have them, we actually end up having more life. Jesus is clear to us on what is most important. When questioned directly about the most important commandment, Jesus gave an uncharacteristically straightforward answer. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love your neighbor. But what does that love look like? That's another one of those questions that the kids like to ask. Um, and another one we usually don't do a very good job of knowing or answering. And I'd like to suggest that we have a hard time um, answering that question and also living out those very simple commandments of loving God and loving our neighbor because we don't have a very good grasp about what, about what love really looks like. Um, we're kind of inundated with uh, bad paradigms of what love is like. You know, romantic comedies set up this idea about love being at a first glance and then it's all done and easy. That just finding the right person is what makes love right. Um, you know, as a culture, we generally have an obsession with weddings over marriage. So all those things kind of feed into this idea, uh, a skewed idea of what love really is. Um, but I'm gonna suggest that we go back a little bit farther even um, to some of our childhood literature. Um, there's a popular children's book called The Giving Tree. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Uh, it looks like this right here, The Giving Tree. It might even be one of your favorites. And I wanna offer some apologies to those that when they think of this book, they say, oh, I love that book um, because I do have a clear-cut opinion on the book um, that I think it gives us a really bad idea about what love and relationships look like. Um, and I want to clarify that I think you know, we're the ones that kind of read it um, in an incorrect way. Shel Silverstein, the author, um, has got a record that um, he doesn't like children's books with happy endings. He thinks they kind of set up a bad example for kids about what real life is like. Um, and so he prefers children's stories that don't have happy endings. And The Giving Tree is not really an exception to that at all. 
Um, so those of you who are unfamiliar or maybe haven't heard the story in a while, I'll give you a quick rundown of what the giving tree is about. There is a tree and a boy. Um, and the boy loves this tree and he spends his time swinging the tree's branches. Um, he makes crowns out of the tree's leaves. Um, he takes naps in the shade of the tree's trunk. Um, and the tree loves this boy and it makes him happy that the boy gets to enjoy um, swinging his branches and sleeping in his shade. Um, and then as the boy gets older, he doesn't come around as often. You know, the trees are waiting for him and he gets a little bit lonely. Um, and then the boy um, turns into a man and he shows up needing something. And he asks the tree for the apples on his tree because he needs to sell them for some money. And because the tree cares so much about this boy, he says, yes, yes, please take the apples. And then the, the boy collects all the apples and he leaves and he's gone for a really, really long time. And then he returns. And he, this time he wants branches because he needs a house. And the book tells us the tree offers him his branches and the boy walks away with all the branches um, and the tree is happy. And I'm going to put that in air quotes now because I'm sure we're confusing happiness a little bit here with maybe some codependency or feeling some happiness in other people's feelings instead of him actually, the tree actually feeling a little lonely. Um, and this continues, this pattern goes, uh, continues until the, the man then returns a little bit older and says now he needs a boat to get away from all the people in his life. And um, the tree says, okay. And so the boy cuts down the tree the trunk and um, leaves again and doesn't come back until he's very old. And this man shows up and the tree is a stump. And that's all that left is all that's left. And the boy and the man now sits on the stump. And the last line of the book is, and the tree was happy. So I'm thinking that maybe we've gotten the idea along the way, hearing stories like this, that, our lo that love looks like giving everything away to the point that we are no longer ourselves that sacrifice looks like giving everything up without exception. That real love doesn't include introspection on our part. Um, to think about, that maybe real love does not include introspection on our part. Um, introspection into who we are, what we're called to be, um, and what we are not called to do. Um, that we are only to give whatever, whatever anyone asks of us um, and to call that love. Or maybe even worse, maybe we're walking around the world like the boy in the story and taking and taking and thinking that by making someone else um, happy, um, by merely doing the very, very bare minimum, by showing our faces occasionally and gracing people with our presence um, every other year or so, that that entitles us to everything they have to give to us. But that is not love. Um, Jesus shows us another way. Yes, we are called to a sacrificial life, and Jesus is the ultimate example of that to us. And also, we are called to live. We can keep living faithful lives as living sacrifices when we dedicate ourselves to the practices that fill us up with the Holy Spirit. Jesus, in his encounter with the woman at the well, refers to himself, refers to himself as the living water and says that those who drink this living water will never be thirsty. At the Last Supper with his disciples, Jesus um, reminds us that his sacrifice, the pouring out of his blood, in that we are filled up. When we take communion, when our hearts are turned towards God, we are in communion with Christ. And we don't need to worry about pouring from an empty cup because Jesus is filling us up. 
even this very scripture in Romans 12 that we're reading today, um, the next verse, so after our first verse about presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. The next verse says this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Um, the scripture here then goes on to encourage believers to discern their particular call in life. Is it prophecy or ministry or teaching, giving, leading or compassion? And then to do that, to do your calling with all sincerity and affection for others. Um, those closest to us and also those that we might name as an enemy, that we would sincerely care and offer our gifts. Our life of faith is not a call to one particular action. Rather, it is a call to respond in every moment with the right posture of heart attuned to God. Um, this last week we had our final class um, in a series, um, Racism, How Should Christians Respond? And it's really been a very powerful time of education and connection in an otherwise time that's been very disconnected. And I'm so grateful for the people that have put it on, for Heather and for David, who put so much energy into organizing it. I mean, also to everyone who showed up, um, to our black members and to other members of color who showed up and were vulnerable with their stories, um, and to our white members who showed up and participated in conversation, who listened. I'm very grateful to be a part of this community. Um, this last week, among a lot of other things, we went through a written series by Dr. Christina Cleveland, who's a social psychologist and a theologian. Um, about what it means to listen as a person who has privilege. And one of her many helpful insights is the difference between problem solving and solidarity. She points out um, that well-intentioned people often want to step in. I mean, if, if you know, oppressed people share the trouble that they're, the struggle they're going through, that there's an inclination to step in um, as a person of privilege and just to want to problem solve the situation. And um, Dr. Cleveland acknowledges that problem solving has its place and she's deeply grateful for people that have done problem solving that has benefited her. But that problem solving cannot replace solidarity. Solidarity is listening deeply, weeping with those who weep, accepting and seeking influence from those who are experiencing oppression. And for me, this really resonates with this idea about what it means to be a living sacrifice, that it's not a one-time thing, that it's showing up every day in every moment in what's in front of us. Um, and that also kind of ties into that idea of our brains wanting to have those closed loops, that we like to finish something that's right in front of us and then call it done, um, as opposed to accepting that some things are going to take a little more time and are a little more complicated than that. Um, but because justice work and the work of our faith doesn't often work that way. Um, sometimes when we want to jump in and problem solve or have an answer right away, we are trying to ease our own discomfort with something rather than truly recognizing um, what is happening in a system or with people that are oppressed. Um, the work of faith, the work of justice is ongoing. There are ongoing work and it's personal. There is a lot going on in this world. Um, we are in a deep, deep need of people of faith living out lives as living sacrifices. The list of places where um, our faith can show up is never ending. And it's going to look different for every person. But there's no shortage of racial justice issues and violence and hunger and child trafficking, um, hunger, greed, loneliness, sickness. Um, the, deep, the needs are deep and wide. Um, you can take your pick. Whatever is breaking your heart is a place you are being called to serve 
and to live your life as a living sacrifice. And this is not easy work, um, but it is also not impossible. And we know that when we turn our hearts to God, um, we are filled back up through the grace of Jesus Christ. And that there is joy in participating in the work that God is doing in this world too, even when things feel hopeless. So some others have felt the same way that I do about the giving tree. And one person went as far as to rewrite the book as the tree with healthy boundaries. Um, and in that version of the story, um, about the time the boy shows up asking for branches to build a house, the tree says, hey now, <laughs> um, I'm happy to let you swing in my branches and to sleep in the shade of my trunk. I'm even happy to provide you with the apples that grow on my branches every season. Um, they're gonna grow again. But no, I am not giving you my branches. Um, you'll keep taking, and at the end, I'll end up as nothing more than a stump. No thank you. So the tree set some healthy boundaries. Um, we might say in our lives that's looking at taking some introspection into our call. And as a result of that, the new story plays out in this way. The boy who grows up to be a man, um, then his son and his grandson are able to enjoy this tree. They are all able to continue swinging in the tree's branches and resting in the tree's shade and gathering the apples every year. Um, and they're also able to care for the tree. Because the tree knew what its job was and took care to set boundaries, it was able to be a living sacrifice instead of a dead sacrifice. Um, I'm gonna leave you with this piece of um, wisdom from some ancient Jewish writings on ethics. Um, and so for you, when this work might seem overwhelming, um, I want you to remember this. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Amen. Thank you, Anna, for um, bringing God's word before us this morning. That 12th chapter of Romans, um, again, begins with, uh, therefore, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, um, present your bodies, present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, for this is your spiritual worship. Individually and together as um, the body of Christ, one of the ways that we um, practice our spiritual worship, one of the ways that we offer ourselves as community is to pray um, together for um, each other, for our nation, and for this world that God so deeply loves. So let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, and in Jesus Christ, you have taught us to pray, and so we pray that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit, that our prayers would serve your will and show your amazing, your steadfast love. We pray for the world that you have made, that evil powers would be overthrown and that wrongs would be righted that those who hunger and thirst for justice would be fed and satisfied so that all your children may freely enjoy your creation. And so we pray too for your creation, which you call good. Protect those in the paths of wildfires, those enduring impossible heat, as well as those in this season threatened by hurricanes and tropical storms. In a time of changing climate and intensifying weather, protect those most vulnerable to their effects. Even as we summon the will to conserve what you have tasked us with stewarding, O oh God, whom we cannot love unless we love our neighbors, remove from our hearts the disdain that belittles your children with whom we disagree. Grow understanding among us as neighbors and strangers, as congregation and friends, young and older, 
demonstrators and counter demonstrators across races and genders and classes and ethnicities that we may have a true experience of one another's humanity in all its glory and in all its wreckage in all our wonder and in all of our complexity. Help us to honor difference and pursue unity with equal vigor. O oh God, who is three in one. And mighty God, sovereign over the nations, direct those who make, enforce, and judge our laws our president and all of our elected and appointed officials, our governor and our mayors, our school boards and our neighborhood councils, may our leaders be guided by your wisdom and may they lead in a way of righteousness that equity and honesty and integrity would be lifted up in our common life together. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world and there is plenty of pain in this world today. Look with compassion on those who are sick. Visit them with healing as a sign of your grace. Lend your depth of insight and wisdom to doctors and researchers working hard on a coronavirus vaccine that the virus, this virus, would, be, uh, would abate and end, that everyone affected by it would be rescued and healed in body and mind and spirit. And stand today with those who sorrow, those who have lost someone near and dear to them, those we know and those we don't know, those for whom their names or their pictures are um, simply that in the media, but still cause our hearts um, to grieve. We pray for those who are aging or are ill or um, who have experienced violence of some sort. We pray, God, that you would visit with those who are grieving with that most powerful assurance that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from you and your love, Jesus. And it is through you, Jesus, our Lord, in whose name we pray, praying the very words that you taught us to pray to our God, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
as we leave this uh, space together today, may you know what it means to be alive. May you seek to be a living sacrifice. May you um, relieve yourself of the obligation to do everything for everyone. And may you also never abandon the work that is before you. Now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.